Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this morning's California Policy Forum webinar. Uh, the, web, the California Policy Forum is a unique partnership between Cal Nonprofits, the League of California Community Foundations, and Philanthropy California, which consists of Southern California grant makers, Northern California grant makers, and Catalyst of San Diego and Imperial Counties. Um, this gives us a unique audience of funders and nonprofits in the same room, and we are happy to have you all here. Um, this webinar will be recorded and it will be sent out within a few days uh, to participants. Please remember to use the uh, Q&A function on Zoom to ask questions to our speakers and to use the chat box to speak with one another. Uh, if you're having any technical issues, please reach out to our event tech through the chat box and remember to stay on mute for the duration of the program. Um, with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to our other moderator, Jen Masaoka, to get us started. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. I also wanted to remind people that we have a live captioner, not a not an AI captioner, but an actual HI human intelligence captioner, and you can access her work um, through one of the things at the bottom that says show caption. So thanks to her too. Um, and thanks, Emily, and thanks to everybody and all the partners around the California Policy Forum. So I'm gonna start by introducing the panelists and I'm gonna make just a few framing remarks uh, and then we're gonna take it off uh, by the hearing from, from them. So just to tell you briefly about them, um, I have, my list is in a different order than these pictures. So you're gonna have to go with my order. <laughs> Veronica Carrizales is the Vice President of Policy and External Affairs at the Alliance for a Better Community, ABC, which is a program of the legendary California Calls. And uh, Veronica is especially noteworthy here because she led the effort to reform commercial property taxes uh, through the ballot measure in 2020 called Schools and Communities First, which unfortunately was not successful, was derailed by the pandemic. I have to say that this is one of the only proactive nonprofit campaigns to reform taxes, right? Most of nonprofit campaigns are around something more directly looking at recipients or beneficiaries, for example. And I, I've, and this was a major uh, groundbreaking effort and I really have felt that Veronica and California Calls has never gotten the, the credit uh, or the stature that they uh, should have from that effort. And it's also, of course, if you know, well, now that you know her, you'll start seeing her name all the time because she's quoted everywhere like in the LA Times, so. Um, uh, Amy Everett is head of Gold State Opportunity, which has a very simple, simply stated goal to end poverty. Um, kind of ambitious, but it, I love it. Um, and previously she worked at NARL and for the Democratic Party. And one of the things I want to make sure you know about Golden State <clears throat> is their terrific website called My Public Benefits. And anybody can go to My Public Benefits and they can sign up from there directly for CalFresh, which is food stamps, CalWorks, Medi-Cal Head Start, um, all these programs that are safety net programs that are funded by taxes. Um, and uh, it makes it really easy for people to, to do that. And it's just great having those all in one place. Um, and Golden State Opportunity also works a lot on things like the earned income tax credit, uh, the Young Child Tax Credit and other programs like that. So we're very lucky to have her here today. And then Chris Sanchez is at the Western Center on Law and Poverty in Los Angeles. And he's also had the experience of working for two members of the state assembly. So he has a real feel for what it's like to be lobbied um, instead of a person being lobbied, <laughs> lobbying. Um, and one thing that really impresses me about the Western Center's recent work on taxes is their work on the state budget, particularly on the issues related to tax rebates. So for example, this year's budget includes 9.5 million in tax rebates, which go, for example, to families with, with incomes below 75,000, for example. And so, um, and one of the things that I think um, is really worth paying attention to is that um, most tax rebates tend to be distributed to registered car owners because the DMV is an easy way to distribute tax rebates. But you know, you immediately know what's wrong with that system. <laughs> okay, not everybody has a car, um, and uh, this this particular agreement um, with the governor um, instead uses the franchise tax board, the FTB, to, to redistribute those, which is a, a much fairer and much more universal way of doing that work. Right. So we're so now I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes, and then then you'll get to hear from these really cool people. Uh, and I want to say something about why we should care about this. And, you know, everybody in the nonprofit and philanthropic communities talks all the time about the expense side of the budget. 
right? We need more money for childcare. We need more money for climate. We need more money for theaters, right? But almost nobody talks about the revenue side of the budget. Um, and it's very, I think this is something that we need to do more of. And a couple of two reasons I think that are important. One is, is that even when we get a, a victory in the budget and we get a bunch of money for something in particular, we have to fight the same exact battle the next year. Okay, it's every single year we're fighting the same budget battles. But when you make a change in tax policy, it's permanent, right? So it has a lasting impact that fighting on the expense side of the budget just doesn't have. The second reason why I think it's important for us to pay more important to tax policy is that taxes are a crucial part of increasing inequality. And I'm not sure if people think about, uh, but the tax system is one of the key drivers to growing inequality. And it's, that has two sort of avenues through which taxes do that. One is that they make rich people richer, okay? Uh, they simply uh, mean that the people at the top end of, this, of the spectrum um, pay less in taxes. In fact, we know that one of the effects, interesting effects on charitable giving recently is that the very wealthy don't pay any income tax at all. So the charitable deduction doesn't mean anything to them. So I think that that's uh, just one indication of how uh, an unfair tax system ends up increasing the wealthiest, becoming the wealth, even more wealthy. But the second part of that kind of, uh, you know, rock and hard place thing is that also when we have less taxes, it's less money for safety net programs. So inequality increases partly because the rich are getting richer and the poor get poorer because of taxes, because there's less money for safety net programs. Um, okay, and then the other thing I wanna point out here is kind of a framing background comment is that when we talk about the revenue side in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors, we tend to talk in generalities. We tend to say things like, well, I'm in favor of taxing the wealth, wealthy or something like that, or tax the corporations. But we haven't done a lot of times the hard work in turning those into viable policies, winnable policy proposals. And you know, we're really good at this elsewhere. So for example, we can take a principle like end domestic violence and we have worked that out and operationalized that principle, for example, into a series of things like understanding the importance of shelters of public education projects, of police training and programs, of counseling, of hospital-based programs and testing protocols, about employment training, right? We've taken a principle like end domestic violence and understood how to operationalize that into to public policy. We haven't done that to the same degree in the tax field. And because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, this is really a pressing urgent issue that we really need to pay, take on. And what are some specific ways that we can address taxes um, that are uh, that are viable, that are operationalized, that are made into real public policy? And so that's, I think, one of the things we're very lucky to have these folks uh, here to talk about. Um, so I'm going to encourage, can you encourage you to put questions in the Q and A box um, after each panelist speaks for a few minutes, and we'll have a chance for a couple of questions. But then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions addressed to all of them or at large. Okay. So, um, Amy, wait a second, I forgot who's first. Veronica, you're first. Okay, so tell us about what, tell us what, so what are you and, and uh, ABC doing right now on the tax front? And what should we all know about it? Great, and, and just to clarify, <clears throat> I'm with California Calls. So I'm the Vice President, uh, President of Policy and External Affairs with California Calls. I'm on the board with ABC. Um, I'm also on the board for the California Budget and Policy Center um, and with Human Impact Partners. So um, I apologize, uh, I think that was um, taken from a previous uh, presentation slide. Um, just, to, just to kind of, before I go into tax policy, and Jan, thank you so much for laying out the importance of tax policy and, um, and, and the importance of how tax policy can be a driver of inequity, um, but how we can also change tax policy to make it a driver of equity in the state of California. Before I, want, before I go into that though, I do wanna talk about some of the contradictions that we have in the state, right? So uh, California is a state of great contradictions as we all know. Um, we, on the one hand, we have an extreme level of wealth uh, California is home to 165 billionaires with a net worth of 688 billion. Uh, many of these uh, billionaires uh, and many wealthy people in California saw an 80% growth in wealth 
um, $551 billion um, over the course of the pandemic year. Um, so we can say wealthy Californians did very well during the pandemic, while many California families struggled to make ends meet. So today we're out of the pandemic, but Californians continue to experience the rising cost of basic needs like food, childcare, and now with this heat wave, utility costs um, and housing. Many of the COVID protections that were put in place to provide essential services are coming to an end. Federal pandemic food aid ended earlier this year. So that means one in five children will continue to experience food insecurity while inflation drives up food prices. And local jurisdictions across the state are ending COVID emergency protections. Uh, for example, the COVID emergency uh, tenant protections for renters in Los, An Los Angeles County expired on March 31st, 2023, along with the county's declaration of public health emergency for COVID-19. Um, unfortunately, this will be creating an eviction tsunami um, in Los Angeles, and this is just this is not just happening in Los Angeles. This is happening across the state. And to make matters worse, the state is facing a $31.5 billion <clears throat> shortfall, and the administration proposes to resolve the shortfall through a, se a series of spending reductions, trigger cuts and delays or deferrals. So I wanna pose that we think about some of these problems with a different lens, right? Instead of looking at solutions with spending cuts, um, we need to be thinking about revenue as a solution. As the protections that we have seen for many low-income families expire and we face a budget shortfall, we have to fight for structural and bold revenue reforms. And not only that, we need to think about and look at the root causes of poverty in the state of California. So when I look at what are the root causes, it brings us back to tax policy, which is where you got to start a gem, right? The root causes of poverty in California, one of, there are many, <laughs> one of the main root causes of, po of poverty are Proposition 13, right? Uh, Proposition 13 passed in 1978. It's been a driver uh, for disinvestment in local services and local government, funding uh, for health clinics, for housing, for street services. I mean, it runs a gamut, right? It, uh, the Prop 13 caused major disinvestment, not only for our local services, uh, but for our schools. It shut down many community clinics. Um, and it significantly reduced funding um, for schools in California. We are still recovering from five decades of disinvestment from the passage of Proposition 13. Um, it fueled inequality uh, in, and disinvestment because it reduced the property tax base. So when we think about what are the solutions to poverty in California, we need to come back to tax policy and we need to come back to revenue, right? We need to come back to new revenue because new revenue makes all the fights that we're trying to accomplish uh, possible. And so my organization, California Calls, when we looked at the root causes, we saw Prop 13 reform as the most structural way to raise revenue, to scale, to address the deep inequality um, in our state um, and to address poverty in California. So in 2015, uh, we took on a multi-year strategy to take on that Prop 13 third rail. Uh, this required harnessing our movement to throw down together. Um, we, uh, we moved forward and put uh, Prop 13 reform, uh, we called it Schools and Communities First, um, on the ballot in 2020. Um, and we came really close to passing it. Um, what our proposal was, our proposal was to raise uh, $10 billion to fund schools and essential services by closing corporate tax loopholes and requiring the largest and wealthiest corporations in the state to pay their fair share in taxes. In 2020, we our measure fell short just by two percentage points, which is about 600,000 votes statewide. Uh, part of the reason that we fell short was because some of the wealthiest corporations in the state outspent us in the final two weeks, two to one. They ran a misinformation campaign. Um, and the other challenge that we had was that the pandemic 
crippled our field program. So what we've come to learn is that when we try to pass progressive revenue reforms uh, and policy solutions around taxes, um, we come straight we, we come straight to um, face to face with the deep pockets of our opposition. One of our biggest opponents um, on that measure was the California Business Roundtable. The California Business Roundtable served as a bundler. So dark money from uh, large corporations in real estate, large corporations in oil, um, funneled money through the California Business Roundtable and raised $100 million to defeat our measure. We've also learned that when we have wins legislatively, our opponents go to the, pal go to the ballot to overturn them. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this because in 2024, we have two uh, major referendum reforms that are going to the ballot that are being put forward by large corporations. There's the oil drilling referendum. There's also the fast food workers council referendum, which will be on the 24 ballot. Not only this, the California Business Roundtable has put a malicious, has qualified a malicious anti-tax measure for the 24 ballot, which would make it difficult to pass uh, local revenues measures um, at the local level by raising the threshold to two thirds uh, and make it more difficult to pass um, statewide uh, revenue measures. Not only that, the measure has a retroactive provision um, that would overturn any revenue measures passed since 2022. So when we're thinking about measures like ULA that are helping to fund um, affordable housing um, and, for, and, and deal with the homeless crisis that we have in Los Angeles, this CBRT anti-tax measure would overturn that. So, so what does this mean for us when we think about tax policy? Um, when, when I think about uh, what we need to do, we need to continue to explore ways to advance structural tax reform so that, um, you know, for my organization, not only are we closing that 2% uh, margin that we lost in, no in November 2020 on Prop 15, but that we're able, so that we're able to fight back attacks. Um, we need to continue uh, to push for progressive revenue and make the case for structural reforms. Um, and we need to continue to build new models to challenge corporate power and bring together broad labor and community coalitions uh, that will endure the current fights that we have to win, but will also be in place for future fights for new revenue. Um, and we need to continue to build the power of the rising new majority made up of low income communities to win bold structural reform solutions. So and then I'll stop there. Okay, I, I'll, I am fired up and ready to go, as I say. Uh, I think um, I'm sure you're going to be sharing with us. I mean, we do have some really important ballot measures to defeat next year. That uh, extremely important, uh, including especially the taxes one. I think has very far-reaching uh, implications. So uh, let us know more about how to do that. Um, <clears throat> Are you going to be working on uh, any proactive ballot propositions, for example, for the for the elect 2024? Yeah, so we've been looking at the proactive um, measures. There's currently a lot of bond measures that are trying to get on the ballot, uh, a few of them legislatively. Um, there's a broad coalition uh, made up of community and labor organizations that's trying to actually do a rules change, um, which is related to Prop 13. And so the rules change would be to change the rules around bonds. So it would move the threshold, it would reduce the threshold uh, to be able to pass uh, bonds um, at the local level uh, to a 55% threshold. Um, and so that's a, a critical uh, rules change. Um, and this would fund affordable housing in the state of California. It would actually fund a lot of uh, potential services uh, in the state. Um, and so that's one um, bond measure that we're looking that is a proactive fight. Um, unfortunately, there are no proactive measures on the ballot in 24 that raise additional revenue, right? So what we're looking at in 24 are potential rules changes. We were looking um, to uh, initially to go to the ballot in 24 with schools and communities first again, um, but the onslaught, onslaught of attacks, right? All the, all the attacks that we're seeing from large corporations um, have, have gotten us to really take a pause um, 
and assess whether 24 is the right year for us or not. Um, and so we're currently exploring with the Schools and Communities First Coalition whether or not um, we go forward in 24 or, wh or whether uh, we go forward at a later year um, where we're, when, our, when our movement isn't spread so thin because currently our movement is spread thin. I really appreciate that kind of back, back, back of the curtain uh, information and strategy, thanks. And maybe you have a good question. Um, can you just say a word more about the proposed measure of retroactively changing the tax revenue? I know it doesn't, hasn't been assigned a number yet, um, but how can we keep track of it? So the California Business Roundtable measure has qualified for the 24 ballot. Um, the, the, it's still early to get a ballot number, mm -hmm. but it's not too early to start doing the work to defeat the measure. Um, so what what um, what currently is is taking place is there's uh, we're having conversations with community based organizations who want to get involved um, so that um, we start to uh, build a coalition uh, that will work to defeat the measure. Um, I know we have a lot of foundations um, on this call today on this webinar. There's a lot of early work that could be done um, to help frame the narrative on the issue. Right. The opposition is going to come out and they're going to spread lies. They're going to say that the measure is about um, protecting taxpayers, protecting uh, people that are making you know, low income residents. And so there's a lot of work that could be done now to change the narrative on the issue so that voters understand what the issue is truly about. So uh, foundations could play a role in helping to uh, fund uh, uh, early work to to establish um, and set the narrative on the measure. Uh, we're also gonna need a lot of field work to be able to defeat it, right? I'm hearing that the California Business Roundtable is set to raise $100 million to pass their measure. This is gonna be a huge fight. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of ballot measures that are heading to the 24 ballot. So our movement is going to be spread thin. So we need to come out early and oppose the measure we need to uh, provide funding for uh, civic engagement programs and field programs so that we're doing uh, voter education on the issue early before the campaign starts spending millions of dollars on commercials and ads. And so, um, you know, that's what I would say is like, we need to come out early, we need to fund early efforts, um, and we need foundations to take a position on this issue. This is a direct attack on all of our communities, um, and we need to take a direct uh, position, we need to take a position on this and work together to defeat it. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we've got to get get ready for that. Um, next, we want to hear from um, Chris um, at the Western Center for Law and Poverty in Los Angeles. Um, Chris, what are you guys working on right now? Uh, thank you, thank you, Jan. Uh, and if I can just take a point of personal privilege and kind of introduce myself and give myself some street cred before we dive into what Western Center is doing and all the exciting things that we have done in recent years. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Christopher Sanchez. I'm a policy advocate at the Western Center on Law and Poverty, and I have the privilege to oversee our legislative agenda as it relates to public benefits, uh, safety net programs, uh, access to justice issues, economic to justice issues, uh, issues relating to nutrition, and so many more. Uh, and to establish my street cred throughout my career, working on policy in the legislature uh, and outside the legislature as an advocate, I've been able to work alongside communities such as garment workers, street vendors, uh, domestic workers, undocumented youth, and other youth who have historically been shut out of the policy process. So that's kind of where I come from in my frame of mind as I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, but before I, I, and the last thing I want to say as just a reminder, two things that, that we need to always think about when we're talking about tax policy and safety net programs. One, uh, the tax code has been cited as the, the uh, most complex legal code uh, in the United States. Uh, set, and the and second to that is the immigration system. So we know those, the, those systems, how, how complex they are. We always have to have that in mind. And then second, we always have to know that the makeup of our communities and how they interact with taxes is very different than how taxes is written and who they were intended for. Uh, so I think that's important. So let's get into it. 
uh, you know, Western Center in Law and Poverty has been very supportive and, and vocal about supporting uh, measures like the Cali ITC and the Young Child Tax Credit, because we've seen how um, supportive it's been for, for uh, those families uh, that have been able to receive it. Um, and, and I think one thing that we've specialized in and conversations with policymakers and others and some of our partners is kind of ensuring folks who are typically left out of these programs are included in these programs. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, when the governor proposed the Golden State Stimulus, uh, he outlined, you know, he wanted to target folks who weren't making a whole lot of money and said, I want to ensure that they're able to get some type of stimulus. Uh, but the reality of a, Cal a CalWORKs recipient or someone who's on SSI is that they might not file taxes uh, for various reasons. Uh, and so how do we include those folks uh, in those programs? And that was something that we did. We also advocated for in, uh, individuals who are receiving general assistance. So in those individuals were folks who are, who are most likely unhoused. Um, but unfortunately, the Golden State Simmons didn't cover those individuals. We have always continued to ensure and advocate for, for them um, in further in future uh, um, tax uh, programs that are seeking to, to assist those that are that are making under a certain uh, uh, income threshold. Uh, and we continue to be vocal supporters of that. So I think that's one thing we always um, have to keep in mind as well. But what are some things that we, we need to have a discussion? And I want to be like the tax code and kind of go all over the place. Uh, but all make sense at the same time, right? Um, I think education and culture of taxing of taxes is is key, and we have to change it. You know, we only talk about taxes from January to April, but the reality is that folks file taxes in California kind of it, periodically because of extensions and other reasons. Uh, and folks who who are who are undocumented who receive I tens, you know, taxes might be a brand new thing to them. They might receive their I ten. Uh, in in you know in May or so forth. So we should have a continuous change of the culture of how we talk about taxes um, and and really institutionalize it. I would say I want to point to how we the strategies and resources that we used um, during um, the census uh, is something that we should kind of pull from and remember that this is how we targeted folks just to say hey you should be counted. Now, this time we're saying, hey, you should file your taxes because you're probably going to benefit from it, right? So it's really having that cultural change. Um, we have to end policies that rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, one, and and uh, so one thing that we're doing here at Western Center is supporting SB uh, 516 by Senator Skinner uh, that changes how uh, debts are paid off uh, from uh, folks who, who aren't able to pay them off or are barely making it in this world right now. Um, and, and, you know, that's just one proposal of many proposals that we've been very supportive of throughout the years and will continue to chip away uh, um, um, in, in that way um, um, as we continue to move forward. Uh, I think another thing we have to remember is not everyone who's undocumented is going to file to receive an I-10. Uh, one, there is a backlog issue at the federal government, so it's going to be very complicated and hard. Uh, and the IRS is not a, a consumer friendly uh, place for folks all the time. But two, uh, aside from Trump, you know, he made it worse, but the, the, the lack of trust with the federal government continues to exist in our communities. So when we're developing these tax proposals and we say, oh, well, the, the undocumented community is included because we include I-10 filers. Yes, that's true, but that's only a percentage of those, of those individuals that are undocumented. We have to really look, how do we gather other, other folks who might not um, be able to utilize uh, such programs when we're building out our safety nets? And that kind of brings me to my next point is that, you know, we're absolutely supportive of, of using our, 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 um, the tax system to ensure folks are able to get more money, uh, but it has to be an ad. It has to be, when we're building out the safety net programs, it has to be continuous um, support for our current safety net programs uh, that currently exist uh, and that and other programs that are currently in conversation like basic income, our uh, universal basic income programs and so forth. Uh, uh, and then uh, lastly, I just wanna kind of give a call to action uh, in general, um, uh, or to the nonprofits, I think, you know, this governor has relied on nonprofits significantly um, to 
administer um, some of this outreach and so forth. But I kind of going back to one of my first points of institutionalizing the, the culture of, of, of talking about taxes, like we have to push back a little bit and say to the governor, hey, we're here to partner with you, but the government has to take a little bit more ownership of this and really change and institutionalize how the culture of talking about taxes uh, is happening in California. So we can, so all Californians can benefit from it. And then for philanthropy, I think we just need to be a little bit more uh, um, uh, flexible when it comes to the needs of, of, um, of the workers at the nonprofits to truly have those conversations that deep that go deep and dive in, into why folks may not be filing taxes and how can we ensure that um, you know the the makeup of someone's family today is able to benefit uh, um, um, the tax systems uh, that we currently have right now. Uh, so that, that kind of concludes my remarks, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Well, Chris, you know, you touched on something that I think is really important, which is a lack of trust in government that's nearly universal. So I think for a lot of people saying, you know, um, government needs more money doesn't sound like something that they're going to agree with. Uh, how, and you talked about it in terms of changing the culture that people do benefit from taxes, of course. Um, uh how how do you how is how are you in the western center kind of addressing that conundrum i, I you know i think we, we you know unfortunately we don't have a, a ground game where we have the the outreach capacity to to uh, discuss it uh with our partners but i think you know in our partnership with our partners who are on the ground i you know we are opening the doors for some of those smaller nonprofits to come into the legislature and and uh, talk about it because I really do think it en ends up being about funding to some of those uh, to those folks to actually get this work done because you know they they have their normal programming and then in you know January and April we say okay then throw this on top of it as well and um, it should be something that's kind of you know a, an item in the budget that's offered every year and 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 uh, that nonprofits can kind of take from some sort sort of grant or so forth. Great, right. thanks. Um, um, okay, and Amy, let's, can we hear from you and about um, what is Golden State Opportunity working on? And uh, what, 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 just tell us, what do we need to know here? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Jan and Emily, for hosting this and bringing us all together. I'm really excited to be with you. Um, again, Amy Everett, I'm with Golden State Opportunity. I've been the president there for four years, and as Jan mentioned, my background before that was really all in um, politics honestly, um, reproductive rights or straight up democratic politics. So what I bring to this conversation, because I think that Veronica and Chris have done an amazing job of really, you know, talking about some of the issues, the revenue side of things and the culture things. Um, I want to talk about the power side of things. And I'll sort of um, wrap this up into what Golden State Opportunity is also working on at the same time. Um, so a little backstory for me, because as Veronica was talking, it brought this to the forefront for me. And it was, um, it's a story about my grandparents. My grandfather grew up very poor in North Carolina. Um, there are so many, he was one of 11 children and he joined the Navy and ended up in San Francisco. My grandmother came here as an immigrant at 16 from El Salvador. They met, they married. They both had barely a high school education, but my, my grandfather made a living rolling, um, fixing telephone poles and my grandmother worked part-time at the Emporium as a sales clerk. On those two salaries, they bought a house in San Francisco. They had and raised five children. My father was the oldest and the first in the family to go to college, as did all of his siblings. So there is a, and there, I bring this up because there was a time in California and there was a time in America where you could be low income and not worry about food, putting food on your plate, not worrying about where you're going to find housing. And I think it's really important that we remind people that like, we're not out, we, the collective folks who care about this, are not out coming out of left field and being like, we want everybody to have everything. No, we used to do it and we need to do it again. So I'm bringing to the question, you know, how do we do that? And uh, just as Chris did, I'm going to establish my street cred, which isn't very much, but it is, uh, both of my parents were accountants and I was born on April 15th. Um, so every year there's a big party for me. Um, so I look at this from what Chris was talking about, that culture of talking about taxes. I mean, one of the good things that we have all collectively been able to work on is getting the government to actually fund the education and outreach and free tax prep year round. We used to be an item that we had to fight for every single year in the budget. 
that has now been put in for like four or five years. Um, of course, the money decreases over time, which makes no sense, but um, but we're going to fight that too. But it's been it's been able to provide funding to small community based organizations, so Golden State Opportunity and other folks who receive the contract with the state contract with um, sub grantees who are in the community, who are the trusted messengers, who are doing the I-10 applications, who are providing free tax prep, and who are telling people that this money that they've already earned is waiting for them to claim it. Um, we have in California, about five and a half million low-income Californians reach and receive the uh, Cal EITC every year. Um, and it's over $1.1 billion just from California and billions more from the federal. But it's not enough. I mean, at one point, the EITC is an amazing program and obviously a huge fan of it. But when it was created in 1975, I think it really helped keep people just out of poverty. Now it's a tool to help people manage through poverty. So we also have to really be thinking about like, what are we doing? What are all of our resources doing? Are we helping people manage through poverty? What can we do to actually, and that's what we mean by end poverty. Um, how do we actually help people get out of and stay out of even close to the poverty line. Um, and one of the, I think one of the most important pieces that we can be doing um, in California is narrative change. Um, if we wanna be talking about a culture, we have to stop using all of the mythologies that people on both the left and the right have about low-income people and create a new narrative. We've seen this work incredibly well with the, um, marriage equality program when they were talking about rights and then they changed it to love. It was just this, everything opened up for them. I thought when I ran NARAL Pro Choice California, when we were the first um, state in the country to, excuse me, to defeat um, uh, parental notification laws. When you change the narrative at a, a substantive heart opening level, and if folks know me, I'm, I'm not very granola. I don't usually talk about opening hearts, um, but I've seen it happen. And I think that is a place that we really all need to collectively work on together. We need to have one story and it's not about a tax policy. It is not about something small. It's about the aspiration that we all need to do what my grandparents were able to do and go back to that sense of how do we make this the country we want it to be? Um, because if we keep talking and, and focusing on you know, really important issues, but they're only a piece of the bigger problem, we need to find um, the first step to, to solving that problem. So narrative change to me is one of the most important things that Golden State is looking at um, and trying to focus um, uh, our colleagues and other groups to really focus on investing in that. So it makes all of our work a lot easier. Now, none of this happens without power building. So part of what we do at Golden State Opportunity is we do power building and we use, it, we use EITC to do it. We, you know, five and a half million people receive the earned income tax credit. Um, and what, what we want to do is not just talk to them at tax time and be like, you can get this credit, great. We're starting to talk to them all year long, not only about the credit, not only about stimulus, not only about all the other programs that are available to them, but also putting them into a database so we can start to work with them as advocates to have their voices more centered in the policy debates that we are currently having, to have them drive what some of the policies need to be because nobody knows what they need more than the people on the ground. So one of the things that we are doing is using the EITC as our entry point to reaching people who are very far removed in many ways from the advocacy and the policy making that is so critical to changing the outcomes that we have. Um, so we are establishing, you know, we reach them and then we go to them and we say, hey, we're trying to expand the EITC, which we are. I mean, there's some bills right now in California where we're trying to expand the EITC. So it's a minimum of $300 instead of sort of the $99 that some people get. Um, we're also trying to uh, make the young child tax credit available for any dependent, not just one dependent under six. Um, so there's work to be done there. And one of the, sorry about that, one of the things that we need to be focusing on is um, not only engaging them, but but linking how government, I think this is a point, Jan, that you made, linking how government has a positive impact on their lives, that government can actually work for them. And the earned income tax credit is one of, you know, it reaches millions of people and the, the vehicle for doing that, because then we can go to them and say, hey, we're trying to expand this, join us. 
Mm -hmm. One of the other things that GSO is investing in is advocacy, cap capacity building for the uh, community-based organizations that we work with. Um, so many organizations are working, you know, long hours, direct service, super important stuff. They don't have the staff or the funding to look up and be like, we've got to go to Cal, we got to go to Sacramento and we have to change policy. And so we're bringing that along with funding to them as an effort to start training them so that their voices and their stories and their needs are better met in Sacramento. That it's not just big organizations saying, we know what's best for people, but actually bringing those folks and those community-based organizations, building their capacity up. Um, I think we need both of those things. We need to, we all know this, I think, which is that um, poverty is a policy outcome. We've been sort of dancing around it. Poverty is an outcome of bad tax policy. It's an outcome of bad legislation. It's an outcome of terrible bond initiatives and ballot initiatives. Um, but at the root of all that, it's policy. So how do we change policy? We change, we grow our power to change the policy outcomes. And, and I'm going to say, um, I know the C3 organization, but if we really want to start making significant change, we need to get into the power making spaces. GSO is going there. I know some other groups are going there, which is establishing a 501c4 and a PAC. Because the way you make power happen is you make people pay attention to you. We have always had the best stories. We've always had the best policies and the best data, but people don't always have to listen until their job is on the line, until they feel how a line worker might be feeling about not being able to say no to bad scheduling choices. We need to make them feel that same kind of pressure, both in California and at the federal level. Because I think without that, um, I think without that, we're going to keep finding Band-Aid solutions to systemic problems, and we need to find the systemic problems, like how do we change the culture and narrative about tax revenue and tax policy? Because if we keep saying tax the rich, that has not worked for us yet. We need the new narrative that makes everybody buy in and want to do this. Um, so I can talk, I'm happy to talk more about um, tax policy, but I think you have better experts on here. But when it comes to um, power building, and policy change, that's where we're really trying to focus and bringing in the people who are most affected into that space. I really like how you've said that, the, that using EITC is not just about getting people to access those benefits, but also to help mobilize them to keep and expand EITC and other kind of tax issues. I mean, one question I have is, you know, EITC has probably done more to combat poverty in California than any single other measure, right? Why haven't, um, why hasn't philanthropy gotten more involved in supporting expansion of EITC and outreach and enrollment efforts? And actually another, another like kind of mystery to me is for example, food stamps, CalFresh. Every time somebody enrolls in CalFresh, that's thousands of dollars coming straight into your county. Okay, and why aren't local governments more involved in and want to see that as a basically a revenue stream is enrolling people in, in food stamps? You know, what I have found, so, and I should also say, um, I've been in the anti-poverty space for about four years, so I have like big eyes and I, I'm still learning about it. And the pandemic really like made me focus at the programmatic level. Um, but my experience is that, um, we have siloed everything. I don't know who the we is who did that, by the way, but it has been siloed. There's the CalFresh program, there's the EITC program, there's the WIC program, there's the this program. And one of the things that I want to take to the legislature is fund the education outreach for Cal EITC and triple it so we do all of the programs. Because if we're spending the dollar to reach somebody, we should be talking to them about everything instead of one thing. Um, so I think that there is just some um, silos that need to be broken down on policy levels and frankly within our own movement. Um, Veronica was really talking about and it really spoke to me when you're talking about the ballot initiatives that are coming up and how we're going to be all over the place. We need to bring a coalition together where we can do, we can all be on the same page and advocating for the same outcomes. Otherwise, we're going to disperse our power and end up with you know, policies made by the California Business Roundtable, which we all know is bad. Um, so one of the things is just we filed ourselves. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, it's the status quo, if I'm going to be honest. The status quo is the biggest enemy of what we want to do, because people are so comfortable with, I mean, this has been my experience. 
people are very comfortable with the way things are. They don't like the way they are, but they're comfortable. So trying to say, let's do some fundamental systemic change mm -hmm. might mean we need to let go of some things that we hold very dear. Um, and that that's going to take time. And I also think that's a role for philanthropy is mm -hmm. to start those conversations among everybody that is funded, bring groups together to talk about what is our North Star? Our North Star, my North Star is not expand the EITC. My North Star is let's figure out how we end poverty. How do we end this ability for that we are in the richest country, in the richest state in the world, and we have hungry people going to sleep at night? That's just not acceptable. But I'm not also saying all we have to do is focus on hunger because they're all interdependent. How do we bring all our collective power together to start to influence it? And one of the steps is breaking down silence. Thanks. Well, you know, something I really appreciated about this whole conversation is it's been very, uh, first of all, I can't remember when I've been in a nonprofit conversation about taxes, uh, much less a meaningful one like this one. And I think all of us um, on the participating as uh, panelists or as listeners on this panel should try to make, get these topics into conferences, into nonprofit and philanthropic conferences um, uh, where they typically don't show up. Um, I think this is kind of a good question maybe um, about uh, from in the chat box, when, when people say rich, what do we mean by rich? And I think, you know, everybody in the United States, it probably even the billionaires think of themselves as kind of middle class. Um, I think one of the things that I'm always reminded of is that the, the median household income in California is $42,000, right? And so I think a lot of times people who make don't compare their own income and their household income to that number. They we typically compare to people that are higher than us. Um, so I think, um, did you want to say anything, Amy, about you know what what does rich mean when you talk about it? Yeah, I think you're making a really good point, Jan. Um, I remember reading an article in the New York Times where people were saying that one hundred and fifty thousand dollars wasn't enough money to live on that they felt poor. Um, and I think it's a matter of perspective. And I think, um, so for us at GSO, we're advocating that under $75,000, uh, incomes under $75,000 should be considered low income and should we should expand all these programs up to that um, at the state level. But $75,000 in California still for a family is not going to be enough. Um, we need to have, I think, just the data that can drive us and then we all need to start using the same number. We need to use the same number in our policy making that is an accurate reflection, not just what we can get, but what the people in, in our state actually need. And it might be an uncomfortable thing. It might be $150,000 in the state of California. Um, you know, it might be, it's different than in Louisiana or other states, but what is a realistic number to raise a family um, in California? I know that raising children costs thirteen dollars to $18,000 per child per year. And yet the federal poverty level is 13,000. And I'm just like, when I go to um, DC, I'm like, it's simple math and it doesn't add up. Let's just go back to some common sense numbers and start to agree with those. So um, yeah, what rich is, is very flexible. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of millionaires who look at those 165 billionaires and feel like they're poor too. Um, but we need to just start to change that narrative mindset and not, I mean, I think policy-wise, we need a number. I don't think we should say a number out in the world. I think we need to find a way, and I don't know what it is, to talk about income inequality that doesn't create blame for people. Because I know lots of millionaires who are very philanthropic and feel attacked. I'm like, well, I don't want you to feel attacked because I want you to keep your, your, your pocketbook open. Um, so we have to really find that that. Mm -hmm. That way of talking about income and about shared prosperity. I mean, I don't know what the words are, um, but how do we find that way of talking about it? So it, we're not pitting rich against poor. Because that's a losing proposition for us. Well, I know my personal strategy is to become a billionaire by buying a lottery ticket to, later on today. I <laughs> Uh, that the uh, so I'm 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 guessing that all of us on this panel are are have our afternoon plans 
uh, focused on that because we want to make it 147 billionaires in California, uh, not just 146. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much to all of our panelists. As you all know that this webinar is not an hour long, it's a little bit longer than an hour and 15 minutes. And our partner, Emily, um, is going to take over handling the Q&A part. And I also wanted to just give a shout out to the people making comments and putting posts into the chat. Um, I think, you know, Anna's from the United Way has just posted something about the real cost measure, which is a really good point. And uh, Chris, something from uh, a point about medium household income varying a lot from county to county. So keep on putting that stuff there too, you guys. Okay, Emily, back to you. Thanks, Jan. And thanks to all of our speakers for that really well-rounded conversation. I never thought I would be so uh, captivated by talking about tax policy for an hour. Um, wait so, a minute. That, wait a minute. You didn't expect a conversation on <laughs> to be captivating. What are you saying? I expected only the best from this group. Okay. Um, so we are going to start with uh, kind of a fun one, and I'll, I'll look out for questions that are coming through our Q&A tool and the chat box as well. Um, speakers, if you could... If you had all the philanthropic support and the nonprofit support uh, that you needed, if you could dream up kind of a tax policy or a tax program for Californians um, that you would run uh, next session, what what might it be? I've put you on the spot with a creative challenge. <laughs> I'll, I'll go, it's not necessarily a tax policy, but it's an, a tax outcome that I want to see. I would move us <clears throat> into a universal basic income program and actually sunset all the um, all of the other safety net or public benefit programs, most of them that we have, because those all require a certain degree of jumping through hoops and proving things. And, you know, there is so much suspicion and, um, you know, claims of fraud, which I don't really believe in, but I would just move it to a, a universal basic income after we establish what a certain amount is and send checks to people. Don't make them fill out their tax form. Don't make them fill out a hundred form. Just Alaska does it. Norway does it. People know how to do this. Um, just send people the money that they need so they can live with dignity. I would do the same. That was the first one that came to my mind. And I was like, is there another one? And I mean, I, I think that would be the tax policy. Um, I think the, the challenge is how do we fund that, right? How do we fund a universal basic income? Um, and I would fund it by reforming Prop 13, right? Closing the corporate tax loophole, requiring um, uh, commercial industrial properties in the state of California to be reassessed on a regular basis. Um, our, we, we recently had um, uh, the team at USC that did our initial analysis um, on this um, re-up the analysis. And what they came up with was that if we were to reassess commercial industrial properties in the very same way that we do with residential properties in the state of California, we would raise $17 billion per year. So that's not going to fund all of Universal basic income, but that's going to take a significant step forward that could get us there. Um, the other way to do it is by requiring um, large corporations uh, to pay their fair share in taxes. Um, I think uh, many corporations in, their, in the state um, are not paying their fair share. Uh, the Senate uh, recently came out with a, a Senate proposal um, for um, increasing uh, taxes on corporations, which actually got killed by the governor, but I think is a, is a way to do this. Um, I saw in the chat that uh, charitable tax deductions didn't come up. I think making changes uh, to our to our tax deductions overall, um, we could raise a significant amount of revenue to help fund um, all of these uh, issues that we care about. And then for myself, I think you know, kind of going back to one of those points about you know paying Peter to Rob Paul and so forth. I would just make sure that you know there's a, there's a lot of old debts that are, that are owed that you know if you really look at them that you know folks would it would just further folks into poverty and I would make sure that there's no way no how that taxes when someone is receiving their their returns is able to get that deducted from them uh, uh, because it's just going to further them into into poverty and we should probably get rid of some of those old debts that are not collectible at all um, and and so forth. 
Thank you all. And we have kind of a, a follow up question from the audience about that. How can we get people to focus on the necessities of those in the bottom 20% of the income spectrum? This may, may be kind of a reframing of UBI. I know we spoke a little bit about, um, you know, changing the narrative change, the way we talk about different groups. So uh, maybe it plays into some of that. Yeah, I mean, I know as policy people, we need to be talking about things like the bottom 20% and the bottom 50% so that we can be making accurate and good policy on behalf of those who need it the most. I think that when we are talking in general to the public about what we're trying to do, when we create classes, we create, we are creating our own enemies, our own opponents, we're empowering them. And so I think one of the things is not to demonstrate how, I mean, this could just be me, but I don't think we need to demonstrate how hard life is for the 20%. I think mean, we need to talk about what we want as everybody, right? We, because look, the number of people who live in poverty in, in California alone, we all know somebody. We all know somebody who struggles with mental health. We all know somebody who lost a job. We all know somebody who is struggling financially. And I think we have to work to have people think, see themselves in that thing, not necessarily perhaps as themselves because nobody, it keeps us all awake. I don't care how much anybody on this call makes right now. We all lay awake at night thinking about something that is financially insecure to us. We need to bring that into a more universal space and talk about eliminating that for themselves and others, but not just saying we need to focus on a very specific set of people because a lot of people, and we see it on the streets, you see somebody on the street, you revert your eyes and you walk the other way. Nobody wants to see it, but everybody experiences it and feels it. And we have to start centering that universalness, not the othering that has been happening that has, I think, created a lot of the challenges that we have today. And if I, if I can continue to just kind of attack the tax code and, and the delivery of our safety net programs a little bit more, um, I think, it, you know, we, thinking about how we deliver, if someone successfully, you know, applies or fills out any type of application, they might not have an address where they can um, receive an EBT card or receive their tax returns, or they might not have a bank account where it could be deposited. And and not having uh, a mailing address is is significant. The Western Center on Law and Poverty, we just published a report in May or March uh, that was called Return to Center that talks about this issue. And, you know, it's simple things of, 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 of getting that EBT card that would ensure folks aren't, you know, are able to have access to food and so forth. Uh, that would make a life change, changing difference. And sure, we have a lot of nonprofits and shelters that are helping out in that way. Uh, but I think if we can't deliver, like physically deliver these 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 benefits to folks, then you know what is that really doing for them? I I want to I I would I pause because I've been thinking about this question and how to respond to the question. Um, so the question is, how do we get people to focus on the necessities of those in the bottom 20%? I, I don't think it's an issue of not having a focus on the necessities. I think it's an issue of who has power in the state and how is that power used to prevent advocates like myself, like everyone else on the call from, from passing progressive policy solutions. So it's not that we don't know that there's a housing crisis in the state of California. It's not that we don't know that there's poverty and one in five children are struggling to get a meal. It's not that we don't know this. Um, and Amy referenced this. In every community across the state, you see the crisis firsthand. You see the crisis of homelessness. You see people living on the street. That is not what is preventing us from a solution. It's not that people are not focusing on it. The, what's preventing us is that the largest and most powerful multinational corporations in the state of California are preventing us from doing this. Now, I say this because I've been working on SB 567, which is uh, the tenant, a tenant Protections Act, right, to prevent homelessness. 
the California Apartment Association, right before the vote, right before the committee vote, put large sums of money in statewide uh, in in the uh, in the packs for statewide legislators. Uh, I see this because when we've tried to pass uh, progressive reforms at the ballot, whether it's Costa Hawkins, whether it's Prop 15, uh, whether it's uh, other reforms, the largest and more wealthiest corporations in the state raise $100 million to defeat us. We're talking multinational corporations like Chevron, like Blackstone, like Kilroy Realties. And this is what we're up against. So the issue isn't that we're not focusing on this issue. The issue is a power imbalance. Who wages their power? Who, how much, who has power in the state of California? If powerful corporations can raise millions of dollars to overturn legislation that was passed by our state legislature, we have a big problem here in California. That means that democracy is not being, and policies are not being established by state legislators. That means that corporations are running the show. And that's a problem that we have. And so when I think about what do we need to do about it, um, you know, we need to make sure that people understand what's happening, right? We need to make sure that we're doing the work to curtail the power of large corporations. Um, AB 421, which is a, a measure that we've been working on in the state legislature that would require the top funders of initiatives to be listed um, in the ballot book and on the ballot is a critical way to do that, right? We need to make sure that we're shining the light of transparency so that when referendums that are that are trying to say that they're that they're trying to help low income communities around oil drilling you know so that people can see that these referendums are being sponsored by chevron and by big uh, uh, oil industries and they're actually not in the best interest of our communities and so um and, and we need all of your help right we need your help uh to make the case and to come out early um, and uh, Amy talked about some of the narrative challenges that we have. The narrative challenges is that taxes in the state are, are non-sexy, right? Taxes are not popular. And so we need to change the narrative around taxes and we need to change the narrative around government um, and, and uh, you really promote a government that cares um, and, and make the connection so that folks understand how taxes uh, benefit uh, their everyday lives. Veronica, I couldn't agree with you more. And I would just wanna add one thing, which is like, we need to build our power. They got their multinational corporations and we happen to know that multinational corporations are not well loved. Um, and so I think the idea of transparency is incredibly important. And so it's just building our own power. If we could get the power of everybody impacted, I mean, I know this sounds sort of Pollyanna-ish and I work in politics, but I know it can happen. We need to build our own power so that we can confront them with not maybe not the same level of resources, but definitely with the people power that it could take to make it a shameful thing for anyone to be supporting, not, not the voters, but for companies to run a corporate social responsibility program where we engage with shareholders to change the outcomes internally. We, we were and we are doing this in the reproductive rights movement and we're having incredible success. I say yes because I was there for 17 years. Um, but there are ways to curtail multinational corporations and what they fund by the power of the people. And we need to start unleashing that. And one of the ways that folks on this call who are in the philanthropy side of things can do things is look at where you invest your endowments. Go, and, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying like then disinvest. I'm saying if you are invested in a Chevron or in one of these multinational corporations, go use your power as a shareholder. Go call a question and pass a, a, a rule within the company that they can't fund ballot initiatives or whatever it might be. But we have a lot of power in the philanthropy in the philanthropy side and in the people side, and we need to start exercising it in ways that are um, making the outcomes what we want. I think we do a great job, but we keep running into these walls. What you talked about, Veronica. We, we bring legislation all the way up to the point. We bring a ballot initiative all the way up to the point, and then we are stymied. So how do we push through being stymied? What are the levers that are working against us? And let's go use them to make them work for us. And if I can just briefly, lastly, on that last point for Amy, um, 
And, and if you're a shareholder, it's not just during that policy conversation, those proposals, it's after we pass it, because we're going to pass it, that you continue to hold them accountable as a shareholder. Uh, this is something that we did with SB62. We engaged with shareholders that were owners that had investments in companies that were opposed to, to some of our legislation, uh, and they engaged with them. They sent them letters. And then even afterwards, the advocacy continues. And so I think it's not it's not just during that policy conversation, it's also afterwards. Thank you all. Um, you know, you've, you've all mentioned um, pieces of legislation and, and regulation that you've worked on in the past. I do wanna give um, Jan just a moment to talk about a really important package of, of bills that um, have been built up through partnership across the state. Um, called the nonprofit equity package that I think really weighs into this conversation. Jan? Thanks, Emily. You know, it's like taxes, it's kind of one of those um, low profile, high impact kinds of work um, because it looks a little technical at first glance. So uh, I think you, many of you know that more than 500 nonprofits have signed on to this package of bills that includes, for example, prompt payments for nonprofit contractors, that includes allowing nonprofits to get electronic payments, not getting checks through the mail that are stuck through the child care, through the door and slot of your child care center. Um, having advanced payments for startup projects. And all of these things are kind of operationalizing equity because small nonprofit, not just small nonprofits, but nonprofits that are community-based often need these things much more than other organizations may. Um, all six of our bills have passed their first three committees, which is an unbelievable victory, unbelievable. So they're in their fourth and last committee right now before going to House votes. So if you haven't already signed on to them, I hope you'll do that. And I think one of the one of the things that's important about this, I think, is that these are all reforms and, you know, government represents about 30 percent of nonprofit income in California. All right. Foundation. It, uh, reflects about 4%. So the fact is, is that you, we talk yet, we tend to talk a lot more about foundation money sometimes than we do about government money. So in increasing uh, the way that governments contract with nonprofits is really an important way. Uh, and one of the things that one of you mentioned, I'm not sure, but the idea, one of the things that has been really important and that some, many of these bills have this as a component is the issue of high, getting nonprofits involved in the outreach about grant programs for nonprofits, for example, as well as about eligibility for food stamps and things like that, that this kind of outreach is just super important to make all this happen. So I hope you'll, I, oh, great. And somebody's put on the, uh, put it into the chat, but so I hope you'll all take a look at that as well. Thanks, Jan. So uh, you've all given us um, really great examples of what philanthropy can do and what nonprofits can do to support this type of work. Uh, with our last few minutes, I just want to give you all an opportunity to give your one or two sentence closing thought, um, whether that's a, a final call to action or something you really hope to see um, from our audience. So anyone, anyone who's feeling inspired can start. I'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, I would say one, you know, philanthropy, you know, this governor has, you know, asked for partnership and so forth and so many times. And I think that uh, it's very, we're very fortunate that that there's that partnership. You know, I'm not sure if it was there during the Brown administration. I, I'm just not privy to that. Uh, but that come that dialogue is open and we need you to absolutely advocate on behalf of those that you're funding as well when you're in those conversations with the governor, whether it be about policy or whether it be about uh, things that he's going to fund in, in the budget. And then just my other second uh, uh, comment and call to action would be when it comes to funding some of these nonprofits, you know, the, those special, those hard to reach communities that we talk about that we we're absolutely wanting to engage with. Uh, some of those smaller nonprofits are going to be those specialists. And so how do we ensure that the reimbursement rate for those nonprofits is actually feasible versus the 75, you know, 25, for example, that is just not feasible for a small nonprofit. So let's work it so they can actually do the work, get the money and, and, and sustain themselves at the same time. I would say uh, my call to action for philanthropy is really to, to come in early on consequential fights, right? Whether or not these consequential fights mm -hmm. are in the legislature or on the ballot, um, it's critical for philanthropy to come in early um, 
and really fund the, the early efforts. And, and when, I, when I talk about early efforts, I'm talking about early research that's being done to make the case on a particular issue, uh, to fund the narrative work. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm more on the policy side and our comm staff is always like, oh, we can't say it that way. Um, and so we need funding to be able to test the narrative and figure out what the right narrative is uh, for low-income communities that will ultimately vote on the issue if it's on the ballot, um, or for legislators who are still trying to uh, connect the dots um, on the issue. And so um, that requires um, early funding to be able to do that. Um, it also requires early funding um, to do civic engagement work. Uh, the only way, uh, and Amy talked about it, uh, Christopher has talked about it, what we have on our side is people power, right? It's our ability to organize broad coalitions, to organize our communities so that we stand together um, on progressive issues. That's our strongest power. That's what we have. The only way we can do this is if we have funding for civic engagement work. And so it, it's critical that there is funding being provided, um, especially in those areas that are considered civic deserts, where we currently don't have a lot of movement infrastructure, where we currently uh, don't have any um, organizations do, doing civic engagement work. Um, it's critical that we're um, investing in, in these organizations and in, in small organizations in civic deserts so that we're we're actually building their capacity, right, to do the advocacy work um, uh, and and the pub and the public education work, right, to be able to move an issue. So uh, that's my call to action: come come out early on consequential fights and look for bold solutions, right? I think too many times um, I th folks are putting their money in what they think can win, and they don't always put their money in the bold solutions. And I think bold solutions that we're only going to get to changing California if we're actually coming up with structural reforms and those need to be funded as well. I'm um, just ditto everything that Veronica said. Oh, sorry, Jan. So go ahead. Uh, ditto everything she said. I will say this really um, succinctly um, in the hardly reached communities, um, fund those, fund the um, organizations that are do know them and are able to reach to them because a $5,000, $10,000 grant to those organizations goes so much further than when you are funding. I mean, like, not to cut us all off of funding, but like it goes so much further than when you're funding a huge organization. Um, but there are ways to reach them that are also more efficient for everybody. And the other thing I would say for call to action uh, for philanthropy is um, don't be afraid of funding advocacy and salaries. It is, I think, somewhat criminal that when I go into a community-based organization and talk to them at the EITC, a lot of times they look at me and say, I qualify. Our nonprofit staff who are working so hard to help others should not qualify for the EITC. They need the money too. We need to reform and rethink how we fund because the people doing the work should not be struggling at the same level as the people they are helping. Um, so that is a pet peeve of mine that I'm really focusing on, but also just that advocacy, that civic engagement. If we want to make change, we have to fund this. We have to put the organizations who have their feet on the ground, who are talking to these millions of people who could become our people power, we need to empower them so they're not afraid to. Because I will tell you that when I talk to organizations about doing going to Sacramento or taking one of our advocacy trainings, they, oh, I, I get money from the state or I get money from these people. And, and they have said none of our resources can go to advocacy. And that is where we are literally just cutting off our noses despite our faith. We have to all get in the same bandwagon and start moving in the same direction. And that means supporting um, the work that needs to be done, not just direct service, but what Veronica said about that fundamental systemic change that doesn't happen piecemeal. It doesn't happen one year after another. It has to happen at a transformative level. Well, I agree with things people said. I've been applauding uh, on Zoom style um, to these comments. I just want to bring up two tax issues that have not come up so far. Um, one of them is the charitable tax deduction. Uh, this takes up a huge amount of airtime in the nonprofit intelligentsia and philanthropic space, and it's something we haven't addressed at all here. 
um, even though it affects only 10% of, of, of taxpayers because only about that amount of people itemize and so can take advantage of it. Uh, and the other one is tax issues related to donor advice funds. We actually have a webinar coming up on donor advice funds because there's been some recent actions in Washington that are moving that agenda a little bit forward. So I just wanna put those in a, you know, just pin them somewhere so we're aware of tax issues that didn't come up. But this has been, I've really appreciated a chance to be part of this discussion. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone who attended for sticking with us uh, as we went over a minute. Um, again, a huge thank you to our panel, to Veronica, Christopher, and Amy, and to Jan for helping uh, moderate our program, to all of our behind the scenes event techs and people who helped put this on, uh, to our closed captioner, Angus, thank you so much. Uh, we will be sending out the recording shortly with any uh, materials that were mentioned, and we appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much, everyone.